Keeping track of your monthly spending habits may seem like a weird way to honor your ancestors. Unless you're me. But every time you pull up a spreadsheet to see how much you spent this month at Ikea, that's exactly what you're doing. As early as 4,000 years ago, ancient Mesopotamians were doing something pretty similar. Now, they were using clay tablets to keep track of their spending, but those simple tables they created have never gone out of style. For millennia, humble tables across different cultures and places have been the logical way to record a whole bunch of characteristics about many things. Of course, these days we've switched to silicon computer chips over paper but the basic idea still isn't all that different. Giving a structure to your data goes a long way in statistics and in life. After all, making connections between things helps us make sense of the universe around us. Hi, I'm Sabrina Cruz, and this is Study Hall, Real World Statistics. Simply put, a table is a structured list of data that organizes the items you're studying and the different qualities about them into a grid. You could put most types of data into a table, but they make the most sense when you're taking a lot of information and boiling it down into something straightforward. Now, a lot of data tell us individual qualities about something, like total cups of lemonade or number of views on this YouTube video. Data like that, about one single characteristic, are called univariate because they only vary one way. But sometimes we want to apply statistics to things that have lots of attributes, like you watching this video right now. When data have more than one variable attached, they're called multivariate. Stay with me here. While you watch YouTube videos, you create a bunch of data about yourself, like the time you spent watching, the number of videos you watch, the categories those videos fall into, and whether you liked the video and subscribed. Subtle. The point is, there's a whole bunch of different variables all related to you as an individual viewer, which YouTube records as data. When the algorithm decides what comes up on your recommended feed or what advertisement to show you, it takes multiple characteristics like these into account at the same time. The upshot is that YouTube's algorithm doesn't treat you as a single number. It thinks of you as a whole collection of different features or characteristics. That would work similarly in lots of scenarios. Like if we were statistically analyzing the risk of cars breaking down, we might look at miles driven or does or doesn't make a really weird noise for each individual car. As you can probably tell, multivariate data are more complex and generally require a bit more tinkering to get into shape for a statistical analysis. In order to keep track of all of this, we need a tool. And that tool is a table. No, not the standard white IKEA lack, although that's useful too. Say we've got a table looking at different behaviors for YouTube videos. Each column typically represents different characteristics like name, length, and times watched, while the rows typically connect those properties to a specific video. And the actual cells would contain information like goat screaming challenge or an odds of going viral score of six out of 10. Basically, columns run vertically and represent an individual variable from the multivariate characteristics of the data. Meanwhile, rows are a separate item in the data set and run horizontally. And the cells are the powerhouse of the mitochondria? No, that doesn't sound right. Cells are the units that contain a single piece of data about the characteristic of the column it sits in for the item on the row it's a part of. They contain data points, which represent a single piece of information. Looking at tables can tell us a lot. One thing that might stand out immediately is frequency or the number of times a value occurs. That's useful for figuring out how common or uncommon something is. Like how way more people are watching a video on extreme fishing than on screaming goats. Although personally, I'm watching a video on how to assemble an Ikea table while screaming. This idea of using two different spatial dimensions, up and down, along with left and right, to organize totally distinct parts of a data set is actually a genius move, and also a really simple idea. One of the most human things you can do is seek out connections and compare things. So it's worth being absolutely, totally clear about how to create and use tables of data. For example, Aisha, our hypothetical archeologist friend, takes great care of her discoveries, unlike some of her colleagues. That includes meticulously recording data in a table. Aisha is on the lookout for specific characteristics in order to better understand the artifacts she finds, both their similarities 
and differences. There's the type of artifact it is, like whether it's a coin or an ostracon. There's also the specific site where Aisha found it, the depth below the ground where it was discovered, and the rough date she estimates it's from. But writing all of this out over and over again would be a chore and would make for a pretty untidy looking table, which we know isn't her style. So she creates what's called a codebook. A codebook describes what's in a data collection, doing things like spelling out variables and linking them to something shorter and more manageable. Codebooks are especially handy when working with a really long list of variables, something that comes up a lot when making a table. It's like a secret code, except the point isn't to obscure the meaning of something, but instead to simplify and streamline it. Aisha's codebook looks a little like this, explaining that type means type of artifact, while other words like age mean estimated age of object. That helps her as she makes her table. She starts off by explicitly writing each of the variables in her multivariate data set with their codebook names above each column. These are often called headers. After that, she can start putting in artifacts, recording each one as a separate item that forms a new row of data. Showing these details in a table will help her see what objects keep showing up the most and where, which is pretty important for someone trying to learn more about ancient history. For example, example, she finds a coin 80 centimeters below the Old Town Market Square, which she puts at about 500 BCE. She records each corresponding data point about the coin underneath the corresponding column in the table. As Aisha adds artifacts, her table accumulates more cells containing data points. Later, if a colleague wants to use her table to, say, check out the site where the coin was dug up, they would simply find the column corresponding to the site variable and follow it down until they landed on the row for coin. So in the end, Aisha is uncovering valuable information and making life way easier for her colleagues even if they don't return the favor. Now we already know tables can show us how frequently data points appear. So it's worth noting that lots of data tables you'll likely interact with are created or stored on computers. Computers can deal with extremely large tables and they're also ideally suited for manipulating data in useful ways. If Aisha starts her table on a common spreadsheet software, she could create what's called a frequency table. This involves selecting just a single variable of her table, like type, and counting the number of times a particular data point comes up in the corresponding column. If she wants to know how many coins she found, she can count the number of times coin, or the code for coin, appears in the type column. But more importantly, the collection of numbers in the frequency column form what's called a frequency distribution. That's a way of organizing data by showing how often different observations occur within a group. A frequency distribution makes it easier to interpret your data and learn what you need to know, which is the whole point of the table to begin with. Like if Aisha is finding way more ostracons than coins, that will help her understand more about the people she's studying, who apparently love pottery. But the magic of tables isn't just that they make looking at individual bits of data easy when you're doing research. They're also part of your everyday life in ways that you might not have noticed. For example, if you select for videos likely to go viral, you'll find a surprising amount of cheap Swedish furniture. This was $10. Spreadsheets in certain file formats are essentially just tables written in such a way that common pieces of software like Excel or Google Sheets can work well with them. If you want to see exactly how to do this on Google Sheets, we've dropped a link to a guide in the description. Behind the scenes, all the computer is really doing is counting the total number of coins or ostracons and so on across the entire column to create a new table which contains each unique data type and the number of counts. For instance, Aisha's new table might hint to her that the location she's been studying likely had a lot of potters, given how common pottery shards seem to be in her original data set. Or a similar table on my YouTube interest might show that I am really struggling to understand IKEA instructions. The leg keeps falling off! In the end, whether you're an archaeologist on a dig or trying to make your screaming goat videos go viral, tables are the tool that can keep us on track. They give structure to data when we want to learn more about large amounts of information. And there's a reason the table has endured for thousands of years. It's basic, but effective. And sure, a table is only one way of visualizing data, but it's one of the most simple and useful tools we have. So just remember, the more data you have, the more important a table 
is going to be. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall real world statistics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, smash that subscribe button, and please tell me how to assemble this IKEA furniture. Thanks for watching. See you next time.